Hello and welcome to the Ronan Mayer Show with me, Ronan Mayer, and my very special guest, Alistair Hames. Alistair, how are you doing? Very well, thanks, Ronan. Great stuff. Just to tell everyone at home um, um, who you are, Alistair is an investment manager turned data journalist, uh, mainly via Twitter, um, but also he's been writing for The Critic, for The Spectator, for Hector Drummond's website. And he's, for the last six months, been at the forefront of data um, with regards to the COVID crisis, or rather the lockdown crisis, um, from, from my point of view, and probably many of you as well. So I've invited him on now because he, yep, he's a superb communicator. He's very good at um, breaking down um, complex scenarios and complex data into um, easily understandable, succinct um, explanations. So yeah, um, Alistair, thank you, thank you very much for joining me. It's a real pleasure to be here, Ronan. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, my my pleasure. So what's uh, what's what's been happening? Crazy times, eh? Crazy, crazy, crazy times. Yeah. Uh, well, it, the first wave of the COVID crisis uh, is obviously long behind us now. Like all respiratory viral diseases, it went down to basically zero uh, in the midsummer. And again, like all uh, respiratory viral diseases, as we get into autumn, it's making a bit of a comeback. Uh, so the big question is, um, you know, how big will the second wave be? Will it be a wave or will it be a ripple? Uh, everyone is absolutely at full panic mode every time that any data is published at all, whether it's the daily hospitalization, cases, deaths, figures, um, the weekly ONS incident surveys, the surveillance reports. I mean, yeah, you know, I've worked with data you know, all day, every day for 23 years. So I'm kind of, I'm just used to the kind of the fire hose of data and information coming at me. And I, you know, I've, I've learned which bits are useful and which bits aren't financially. But you know, if you're if you're trying to be a kind of an armchair uh, data analyst at the moment with everything that's being published daily, it's 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 almost too much to cope with. Some of the media is more numerate than other bits, and even the numerate media sometimes focuses on the important bits and misses the unimportant bits and vice versa. Very often they focus on the unimportant bits and miss the important bits. So, yeah, it's a quite extraordinary position to be in. Um, you know, we're speaking, just for the record, it's the um, 18th of September. Uh, and it, schools went back around a kind of a week and a half ago, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and well, cases look as though they're dribbling up. There's, there's talk in the press about a second lockdown, not clear to what extent. Um, the lockdown will be just pubs closing early versus everyone being ordered home to, you know, to work. That's all being sort of telegraphed in the, in the press. Um, and, you know, we've got absolute chaos in the testing system. We've got chaos at schools. So it's, uh, I'm hoping that when we listen back to this in, you know, future years, we'll have a bit of a chuckle and think this is the kind of peak chaos. But I've been saying that, you know, most weeks for the past six months now. Right, yeah. Um, and, and how do we get here? That's a, um, a question which I think I think needs to be asked, and I think it's it's one which you'll be very good at explaining. Um, from from early this year to to now, roughly, how did we arrive at such a situation where um, we now have regional lockdowns? We seem to have um, different rules in different parts of the country. We have an increase in restrictions um, from from today. Um, for example, now venues which do not take details from customers as they enter the premises um, can be fined £500, which is an extraordinary um, invasion of the marketplace, an extraordinary um, collection of, of data on a mass scale, um, and, and much more besides. I mean, the, the, the North East is, um, is apparently the, 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 the hot spot of, of COVID um, infections. And there's the claim that infections are rising constantly, as you just said, but um, the counter to that is that they're testing more, and what we really have um, is is a case demic. So, yeah, how do we how do we get here, Alistair? Well, if you wanted me to summarise how we got here, Ronan, um, I think I I think I recall that line from a couple of Bond films ago, where a dying Mr. White looks at James Bond and he says, "Mr. Bond, you're just a kite caught in a hurricane." Uh, the truth is that the main reason we've got in this fix is that we have this illusion of agency. You know, we have this illusion 
that this um, tiny, minuscule, micros you know, sub-microscopic virus is something that we can realistically control. And I think that's always been an illusion. Um, you know, the people who early on were trying to point this out, people like um, the German-American biostatistician Knut Pitkowski, uh, and then at Oxford University, Professor Gupta, uh, Professor um, Gabriela Gomez, all these people who took a slightly contrary view to the sage and government view were silenced, not, invi not invited to sage meetings. You know, when they put their views on social media, on YouTube and so on, they were, they were taken off because they didn't go along with the WHO guidance. But all along, it's because we thought that there was some way we could actually stop this epidemic from progressing, um, as opposed to protecting the vulnerable who needed protecting while the wave of the virus crashes over us. And in fact, not even those eccentric uh, or sort of marginalized people, but you know, if you look at um, Sir Patrick Balance, the chief scientific officer, he was absolutely explicit in mid-March that the only way we're gonna cope with this until there is a widely available effective vaccine is to protect the vulnerable while the virus passes through the healthy. That was the only game in town ever you know, the, the cocooning or shielding or herd immunity or community immunity, call it what you want. But that was only the ever that was only the that was the only approach that was ever actually available. And like I said, the first wave is now long, long behind us. You know, we, we went below the epidemic threshold, depending on how you define it, I certainly no later than 10th of May. Um, so we didn't have any alternative through the first wave. I mean there is there is no vaccine immediately on the horizon, so we're not going to have a vaccine available for the second wave either. Uh, so basically, I think the, the reason is that we, we, we could have gone down, if you like, the Sweden route. Uh, we could have gone down kind of mitigation and protection um, and cocooning and shielding and all those things that made loads of sense and which you know, centuries of epidemiology have proven to work. And then we've tried to have this completely unproven um, approach of trying to literally stop uh, a virus in its track. Now you can do that, if you, if you get in really, really early, like New Zealand did famously, you know, if, you, if you completely seal yourself off for the rest of the world and you completely stop uh, civil liberties, you can maintain uh, a fully susceptible population. Uh, and then the moment they uncork and the moment they open themselves to, to the rest of the world, the virus will find them there. And so I think you know, that, that if I just summarise the whole thing, we got here because we thought that we had much more agency and much more ability to stop something which our human brains are just not designed to understand viruses or the way that epidemics progress or the inevitability of some of these biological processes viruses are very likely you know some of the very oldest forms of life if you count them as alive our brains just are not put together to understand how small they are they're not designed really we're not designed to understand the way that um, epidemics progress um, so I think that's probably how I'd summarise it. As to where we are now, um, you know, we've got to a stage at the moment where in England, according to this morning's um, ONS incident survey, it sounds like about one in, one in a thousand people in England are currently carrying the virus that can lead to COVID. Um, there's a, so there's about 60,000 people currently infected uh, in England. So if you think that we can sort of draw, draw some kind of protective ring around all 60,000 of those people and stop them spreading it to people in the next week and you know you're absolutely deluded it's, it's, this, this, this is rapidly becoming endemic now and um, we're already at the stage where there is no alternative but to go for herd immunity not as a strategy but just as an acceptance of that's how epidemics always die out and the best you can hope to do is to you know is to protect the vulnerable or you know or maybe not so much protect the vulnerable but tell them how to protect themselves. And in fact, you know, when I read the ONS survey this morning, I was really, I was you know, very, very pleased because what it shows is that the virus is spreading at a rate of knots through the young, through young adults in particular. Um, whereas it doesn't seem to be progressing at all in terms of you know, increased prevalence uh, amongst people over 70 years old. And that's exactly what you would want. You, know, you would want the elderly to be taking lots of precautions you know, and um, minimizing their risk while the virus goes as quickly as possible through the healthy population so that the virus will find it harder and harder to find the nooks and crannies 
where the vulnerable are, you know, as it were, hiding from it. Uh, so that's probably, that's probably a reasonable summary of, of how we got here and where we are now. Thank you. Yes. Um, just go back to to March and Patrick Valence. Um, I remember watching in horror as Boris on that fateful weekend just before um, we locked down around the twentieth um, appeared to be going for um, you know he was he was advising that people who are sick should self isolate, but apart from that we should get on with our lives. And then over the over the course of the weekend um, he he changed his mind under enormous pressure from the media um, which was beating him over the head with the Ferguson Doomsday Report predicting that hundreds of thousands of people would die. It does seem that Patrick Valance um, was probably behind Boris um, just before that weekend um, telling him um, what, what to do. So I suppose in some ways the media um, um, and Imperial College defeated Patrick Valance. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Well, I think the one thing I'd add to that is um, Macron. You know, Macron was openly talking about sealing mm -hmm. off the Channel Tunnel, uh, you know, sealing France off from England and leaving us as one kind of massive lazaretto. Uh, and, you know, the entire world was clearly going down one particular route. And, you know, it would have been pretty ballsy of, of Boris to say, you know, I'm going to do what nobody else apart from the Swedes is doing. It would have been a huge call. Um, I'm not sure, really, what Patrick Valence was thinking. Uh, because he was at the 10 Downing Street press conferences explaining very clearly how the you know, community protection, community immunity, herd immunity plan works. And he was on Newsnight, he was on Sky, making it crystal mm. clear. Um, Sage Minutes don't record um, that uh, there was ever an advice to do a full lockdown rather than you know, more incremental social distancing. Uh, but then obviously in the last few days, an, e an email has suspiciously been released into the public domain, which I think seems to say you know, that, you know, that Valence was sort of claiming that he was all in favour of an earlier lockdown. So I'm not entirely sure what guidance he was giving. Um, as, as for Sage, I mean, the problem with Sage, I think, uh, and it's easy for me to sit outside and not make a scientist, but it didn't seem to have done a very good job of making sure that there was a devil's advocate on the committee. Um, in investment, you know, we, we always try and challenge our, our theories. And if you have a committee, you ideally could nominate someone to be red team in a very sort of Dom Cummingsy way, you know, to sort of challenge civilly and politely, but sort of challenge and provide some scrutiny. Whereas it does sound like the epidemiology um, people who were on stage were all coming out with exactly the same, like suspiciously the same um, recommendations and models. And meanwhile, outside of Sage, you had teams like the Oxford team. Uh, with uh, Professor Gupta coming out with completely different readings of identical data. And, you know, I think it was a bit remiss of them not to invite them on to say, hang on, you're highly qualified, you've got the same data, why have you come up with a different view? So I think maybe the way SAGE was put together wasn't terribly well thought through. Um, and also the, one of the problems with um, people like that is they although they might give a range of forecasts, it's only ever the worst forecast that will make it into the media. And if you have someone uh, who's sitting in the committee who's not used to you know, hearing these huge numbers, um, they will only focus on the biggest number. So you, know, you will automatically go down the most protective route um, for COVID. Uh, it doesn't sound like anyone ever put their hand up and said, hang on, if we go down this lockdown route, what's that going to mean for the rest of the healthcare system? You know, if we're effectively shutting any departments, booting you know, sick people back to care homes, uh, closing GP surgeries, what's that going to mean? You know, if, even if you leave aside the fact that you know, they're really, really looking at three week lockdowns, so they probably wouldn't have looked at, they wouldn't have looked at economic consequences, uh, which obviously, you know, the worse an economy does, the worse healthcare goes. They may have left that to the side, but there seems to be no sort of cost-benefit analysis at all. And a few people have said that, you know, there should have been an economist on SAGE, which I completely agree with, not because econo you know, economists look at money, but because economics is the study of decision-making under uncertainty when you have limited resource. It's all about costs and benefits and the realisation that, you know, if you pull a lever, it's attached to more than one cog. 
Um, whereas it, Sage looks like it was just attacking this one problem as if there was no other consequences. So kind of, a, of course, the way it was put together, they would come up with the most risk averse way of dealing with just that one problem without thinking of the impact on you know, the broader health system. And that's why I think lockdown has been such a huge killer because it was, you know, it was, it was never, it was never considered uh, as the obvious consequence of COVID. And for all the brilliance of the minds on Sage, and for all the intricacy of the of the models, it's quite clear they never even broke out care homes as a separate line in their model, even though that's about forty percent of the deaths. So yeah, I mean, the, the inquiry is going to have to focus on. I mean, I frankly, I just couldn't care less about the name allocation, but you know, there will be another epidemic, probably you know, in our lifetimes. You know, ideally, they will learn the lessons of how to put a better committee together to make sure that expert failure isn't an absolute given from the way it's constituted. Yeah, um, the inquiry. My concern with the inquiry is that it is going to be framed um, um, kind of in line with, um, rather, it's going to be framed to reflect Parliament and Parliament's opinion, um, which is overwhelmingly pro-lockdown. Um, and where where it's criticised, it focuses on lockdown not having been imposed early enough, um, rather than on whether the lockdown was the right way to go in the first place. Um, do you think do you think that's where 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 we're going to go with the inquiry, or do you think it'll be more open and Professor Gupta and Carl Hennehan and um, other dissenting voices um, will be heard? Well, that's a very good question. I'm, I think I'm probably one of the few people from the sort of lockdown skeptic side of the argument who doesn't think that the inquiry should be done very soon. You know, I think uh, the Swedes, who basically called all of this right from A to Z, they think you know it's going to take maybe 18 months or so to work out which country did things right and which country did things badly. Um, so I think we need a little bit of perspective. I do think I do think it'd be much better to have you know, however many waves they're going to be, hopefully there's sort of one big wave and one tiny ripple. But I think it needs to be in the rear view mirror before we can really take the lessons uh, away from it. But I mean, yeah, I hope they make it as wide ranging as possible. And I hope they focus on how, you know, how to, how to, how to really focus on it and you know, not happening again. But I mean, one, one thing that makes me just despair is that I'm looking at today's um, surveillance report, co coronavirus surveillance report that's released week weekly. It just doesn't seem as though we've learned any of the lessons from the first wave. You know, just when the second one's starting, you know, I, I looked at the detail this morning, and in the last week, there's been 228 uh, COVID outbreaks in care homes in England. Yep, uh, yep. This is exact. That was the only thing we had to do uh, in March. It was the only thing we had to do now, and it just looks like we just don't seem to be able to organise our systems whether that's PPE, whether it's you know, testing visitors and people being admitted, whether it's making sure that care home staff aren't moving between care homes more than absolutely necessary. But the one thing we had to do was keep it out of care homes, which, like I say, that's 40% you know, of the deaths, uh, even though they account for, a, I think, probably roughly 1% of the population, I think, are in care homes. Uh, they account for 40% of our deaths. So very clearly, that's the one thing we had to you know, to make sure, and it just looks like we're making the same mistake again. Um, so in the last week, you know, everyone's everyone's now talking about closing down hospitality for half term, or maybe even you know, longer. In, in last week, you know, in, even though we're at the tail end of Rishi Sunak's the you know, Dishi Rishi Sunak specials, you know, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, there was only twenty five outbreaks last week that were traced to food outlets and restaurants. Twenty five, and there's two hundred and twenty eight outbreaks in care homes. So, you know, we do the intervention where it's not required, and then we don't do the intervention where it is required. Uh, it makes me, you know, makes me tear my hair out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. Just to, just to play devil's advocate slightly with the care home situation, I wonder to what extent um, it actually cannot be stopped. I wonder if, if you know, there's, there's the analogy of the fence around, around the building and trying to use that fence to keep wasps out. Um, I wonder. I wonder if if it's inevitable that the, that the virus is going to to move around. Now I know um, basic laws of physics. If you keep particles separate um, at all times, then sure, if viruses are, are among them. They're not going to cross contaminate. But it seems, practically speaking, that it may be extremely difficult to keep the virus out of care homes, unless you know the staff are wearing hazmat suits, maybe, and um, are sort of 
holds it down with an, with, with um, Dettol um, as they enter the building and all the rest of it. What, what do you think of that? Well, I think there's a, I think it's a very good sort of null hypothesis to have actually. Um, I mean, if I was to if I was to kind of challenge that, what I'd say is that, you know, if, if if you or I were in charge of allocating the number of tests that the country has now, you know, we've got hundreds of thousands of tests we can do, but well, even a couple of hundred thousand tests we could do a day. But given that we know the number one important thing is to keep the virus out of care homes, you know, um, I do first. Actually, in fairness, I will say they do seem to be prioritising testing at care homes. So maybe they're finding the outbreaks because they're testing that. So I'll give I'll give them that. Um, but you know, for example, if you were to visit a care home, maybe it would make sense that you have to be tested. You know, maybe forty eight hours apart, two negatives, forty eight hours apart means that you can visit your relation who's in a care home. That would seem a relatively sensible use of two tests to me. Um, you know, maybe really trying to tackle this problem of the uh, agency staff going between the care homes. Um, maybe that would be sensible. Um, but more broadly, in terms of all of the policy levers that have been pulled, one of the problems with the lockdown is that it's universal, not just regionally, um, but it affects all, all the all age groups. You know, so the 20-year-olds so have been just as locked down as the 80-year-olds for the last five or six months. Now, I'm not sure that that is the way to minimise mortality, even for COVID in that you're basically delaying the young reaching uh, an immunity level. I'm not going to say necessarily herd immunity, but an immunity level where it's going to be less likely that they're going to be carrying the disease at any point, carrying the virus at any point. So what you'd really want to do, if you could design your own epidemic, is you would want it to pass as quickly as you humanly could through um, people who wouldn't be vulnerable to the disease that the virus causes, right? So you'd want, looking at, the, looking at the age profile of people who really suffer from COVID, you would roughly want this to pass as quickly as possible through everyone under about 40 or 50 years old, because then they're much li less likely to be carrying it when they bump into someone who's 80 years old. You know, and meanwhile, while that's happening, and until incidence gets down to some sort of pre-agreed level, you do say to elderly people, listen, you need to take care. You know, if you think masks make a difference, wear the masks. You know, really take social distancing and ventilation and you know hand washing take all that stuff ultra seriously while the virus is passing through the people uh, younger than you uh, and in fact there was a royal society paper written um, a couple of years ago that made this exact point on how to deal with an epidemic you know by not taking blanket uh, approaches to how it should pass through the population taking differential approaches by year group and, just seems to be completely ignored. So I think the problem is that our interventions have probably, they may well have made the COVID outbreak worse by not allowing it to pass through the healthy. And they've certainly caused all kinds of you know, health disasters, particularly on cancer referrals for you know, everyone who COVID wouldn't have affected. Um, but I, I do take your point, maybe it was always impossible. Maybe we're always kidding ourselves that it wouldn't get into the care homes. Um, but you know, with the benefit of hindsight and with the benefit of a bit of analysis, given that the tools you've got are the various social distancing levers and the testing, you know, I, I don't think we've used either of them in the best way. Yeah, I mean, I, I broadly agree with you. I'm, I'm just, I'm just um, playing devil's advocate with it, really. Ooh, yes. um, and beyond the care homes, which I, I, I think, I think, you know, um, the decision in mid-March to discharge um, people from hospitals into the care homes and was was obviously catastrophic and obviously um stupid perhaps even criminally stupid we will we will, we will ha um, find that out in the future i hope um but the situation in schools your 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 children have um have had problems haven't you um you've had problems trying to get them get them back and your your little girl was sent home the other day wasn't she yeah oh god fourth day of school yeah she, so she's missed six months of school and then four days into the first, you know, four days into the term back, you know, she's just gone into senior school. One of her classmates, her cough, you know, obligatory uh, school protocol kicks in, has to have a COVID test, comes back positive. So I think 25 kids from her class have been sent home for a fortnight. And uh, the guy who tested positive was a boarder, so the entire boarding house is locked down. Uh, we're quarantined, so that's 45, 45 kids there. So 70 kids. I'm about to miss out another fortnight of school 
because of a boy with a cough who's now absolutely fine. Um, you know, he's 13 years old. The virus is never going to be any challenge to him. Uh, you know, most and most of the parents, most of us parents, and most of those kids are in our 30s or 40s. There's no the virus would be no risk to us whatsoever. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, another fortnight of education. I've got three kids in different classes, in different years, in different houses. So the chance of this not being a kind of World War One style rolling barrage of, um, of, of quarantines is, uh, is basically next to nothing. So I've, I've just kind of written this term off. Um, what, what I'm hoping is that, you know, again, I'm hoping that we'll look across the channel and copy a much more sensible idea. Because I, I just had a fact of a WhatsApp message just before we started this call from a friend in France uh, saying that they've got a new policy now in France whereby if somebody, if a kid tests positive, they have to isolate for a week, but nobody else in the, in the class has to do anything unless they get symptoms. And that's, that's plainly a much more sensible system. But meanwhile, we've got, you know, we've got schools and year groups closing by the hundreds at the moment. It's a completely unsustainable situation particularly after kids have already missed six months of school. So it's, um, yeah, it's absolutely, the school situation is absolutely disastrous. And I just hope they pivot away as quick as they possibly can now. Yeah, it just seems to me that um, problems that the government and the opposition in particular, if you can call it opposition, um, focus on, like inequality, are only being exasperated by the situation. So um, I think it's one, it's one thing if well-educated middle-class people like you um, have children off off school and at home, but um, the situation um, in in poorer, um, less educated sectors of society um, is is quite different, isn't it? And my oh, I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. I mean, this is this whole this whole use of of lockdown and and the, and the interventions is going to be an absolutely peerless uh, social inequality wedge. I mean, it's good. the public schools, you know, when you're quarantined, you just have to join the class by Zoom, you get, you know, electronic homework, the support you could possibly want. Whereas, you know, a lot of the state schools are just closing, you know, the state schools in, in, in poorer areas in particular, the exact places where you, where you need to get the education system up and running again as quickly as possible. You know, they're, they're actually going to have much less support. So the longer this policy continues, the more the damage to um, social inequality. I think I read a report saying that uh, the six month lockdown may well have undone a decade of uh, closing the attainment gap between the richer and poorer. And I mean, just how much longer can we tolerate it? It's, uh, it's it, just like you said, a lot of the kind of the middle classes, you know, if you go home, you just means you work from home from your computer, pop out into the garden every now and then, it's really, you know, it's not that much of an intervention. Whereas, you know, if, if you're young, and less privileged you might be sitting on a laptop in the corner of your bedroom trying to dial in or work or or much more likely you're either furloughed or trying to get a non-existent a non-existent job so yeah the in terms of social inequality they need to get this um, lockdown lifted and lifted in full particularly for the schools you know as quickly as possible they need to kind of run don't walk to get this sorted out now i couldn't, I couldn't agree more then yeah, I mean, I've I've heard um, awful stories about um, children who who are at home with, um, you know, alcoholic or, or drug addicted um, parents, or or just one um, one of those, um, no internet, um, hardly any food in their stomachs, um, just dire dire situations where, you know, where where ordinarily um, school is a bit of respite for the kid, you yes. know, away from away from the horrors of home life. Absolutely um, right. You know, and, and I know a lot of the teachers are tearing their hair out about, about it. I've got, I've got friends who are teachers at you know, not great schools um, and you know, they're not allowed to follow up on whether homework's been done because uh, still so few of their kids have got um, uh, the sort of electronic devices or, or Wi-Fi or anything like that, or they haven't got the home environment conducive to catching up on homework. So you know, huge numbers of, uh, of you know, the underprivileged have just literally had six months of no school. So it's going to take them a while just to catch up with where they were, never mind kind of rejoining their educational journey where they stepped off it. I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I just hope it's being tackled uh, inside government with some of the urgency that we don't see from outside. Uh, because, you know, if this carries on for the rest of this term, it's, 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 it's going to be a complete write-off. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in Bristol. I think we've got six schools now. Uh, as of last night, we've got outbreaks which have led to either 
you know, year groups or schools being closed down. That's just in one smallish city. So, you know, you add another couple of weeks of the, um, the virus being detected when kids with, you know, the normal seasonal, the normal seasonal, seasonal uh, bugs get tested and the whole educational system is going to fall apart before it's got going again. Yeah, I, mean, I say that's, that's, that should be the number one priority for government. I mean, if anyone was listening to this, I would say drop everything and sort out the guidance for schools. You know, they have isolating contacts of, 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 of um, positive cases makes absolutely no sense if the, con if, if the, if the other kids themselves would be at no risk and if they live at parents who'd be no risk. I mean, maybe, maybe say, you know, your child was very close to uh, an infected child, uh, an infected, a child who's tested positive. So, you know, if that child happens to live with somebody who's, you know, 80 plus or has, you know, kidney disease or, you know, some, or, you know severe diabetes or something, maybe they should be allowed to, to stay off for two weeks to isolate. But someone like my daughter, you know, she's super healthy, I'm healthy. There's just no reason for... Uh, the vast, vast majority of kids who are now going to be isolating to isolate. And you know, coming back to what I said 10 minutes ago, every time you do that intervention, you're slowing the spread of the virus through the healthy, which means that you're making the susceptible, uh, vulnerable population more likely to encounter the virus. So, you know, you're sort of, you, it, it just couldn't, it, it could not be a worse policy. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like total madness to me. Um, and it, seems to stem from um the stigma stigmatization of the word of the term herd immunity um this this uh equivalent um with i don't know genocide or something like that oh. you know again it's, this is our media though isn't it um uh, totally irresponsible totally um thick in many ways i think um you know well i mean the herd you know to, to give the media to cut them a little bit of slack when let, i heard let's, the press let's not cut them any thought, slack Okay, okay. Just, so let, let's imagine I were to cut them some slack. I would say that the words herd immunity, okay, it might be the technical term in epidemiology, but can we not come up with a nicer way to describe, you know, humanity than a herd? It just, you know, we don't like to be, we don't like to think of ourselves as animals. You know, if it had, if it had said been, you know, so if, if we'd instead made people think that by embracing, you know, the strategy of, you know, allowing, allowing the virus to pass through the healthy so that it could pass over the vulnerable if we could have found you know, better marketing you know and emphasizing the agency of sort of embracing that as the only way through uh you know and stressing that in a community immunity uh you know it, I, I think it would not have had the reception it had but there is a kind of a knee-jerk reaction as humans to being compared to animals um so i really wish they'd rebranded it first I and mean, it's it's you know it's of it's of a piece the fact that you know you have scientists who are used to you know, talking to each other in scientific um, committees. It, it should really pass through you know a kind of a marketing or PR <laughs> uh, you know think group before they say it to the public. You know kind of you know, they, if there's going to be a knee jerk reaction against the term herd immunity, just a little bit of rebranding, and maybe you know we'd now be following the Swedish route and uh, we'd be long out of this mess. Yeah, I, 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 I do. T I do take your point. Um, I just wonder if um, it's got more to do with the media being so um, anti-Tory um, than than the term itself being, you know, perhaps perceived as, as dehumanising. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, it's it, the, the media gives gives the, their punters what they want, though. And you know, people do seem to be really enjoying being terrified. Mm. You know, it's like you're sort of trapped in trapped in a in a contagion contagion movie, um, and you know all these 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 statistics, which are very you know any statistics that's moving in the right direction is just not reported, and anything that's going in the wrong direction is absolutely gleefully reported, and you know you you can see it, you can see the comments sort of lighting up below the tweets, and you can see the lurid headlines. It's, they're obviously giving people what they want. And, you know, as a result, you know, the more the public reads it and the more they kind of bray for harder and earlier lockdowns. I mean, it's almost like the Romans sort of begging to have the bread and circuses taken away from them. Uh, and then the more they say that, the more the media will give them what they want. And it becomes a kind of horrible kind of self-reinforcing, you know, circle. So I don't know quite how you kind of um, pull a handbrake on that or short circuit it. 
uh, to get out of it. I, but I do think the original, the original um, kind of presentation of it was was flawed. Um, and uh, it, probably the most cack-handed thing is when it looked like the first wave was gone, it was then standing at lecterns with hazard tape all around them, telling people it's safe to go back to work. I mean, it's just, you spend three months telling people there's a shark in the water and then you tell them to go swimming. Absolutely ridiculous. So, yeah, the, I, I, maybe one other thing that needs to be sort of uh, beefed up is, you know, is, the, is, the, is the PR side of um, the 10 Down of Ten Downing Street's presentation because they do seem to be giving extraordinarily mixed messages. You know, they're, they're telling us to eat out to help out. And then two weeks later, it's the young people's fault that the virus is spreading because they, they relaxed too much, according to Van Town. I mean, it's, do you want to incentivize people to go out more or do you want to tell them off for going out more? It's got to, it's got to be one or the other. So um, rant over. Oh, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the, the messaging has been absolutely awful. Um, I'm just rewinding there to, to the media for one moment. Um, yeah, I think the, the age old uh, newsroom mantra, um, if it bleeds, it leads, is at the heart of the problem. Um, there's no, no such thing as, as, as good news, really. Um, bad yeah, bad news is right. good news. Yeah. Um, so and if, you ever, if you've ever wanted an opportunity to you know, land a good punch in the government, this is it, in spades. You know, every, every wrong move can be absolutely celebrated. And you know, if, if just to be fair to the, just to be fair to the, to the, to the government, and if you go back to March, it actually wasn't entirely clear what was coming. And to be honest, the original lockdown, 23rd of March, I supported. And if I was tyrant, I'd have done exactly what Boris did. I'd have said, you know, coming out of winter, the, 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 the health system is fairly full still. You know, we've got, we can see what's going on in Northern Italy. The parameters of the disease are still very unclear. The treatment protocols are still very unclear. And so we're going to have a limited three week you know, shut down for all those things to clarify and to build capacity, uh, and then we're going to then we're going to revisit it. Um, and I think that was actually a sensible move. The only problem is that it ain't mid April anymore. And they kept renewing. Obviously, Boris getting ill was a complete nightmare. Um, but the original lockdown, I think that was. Yeah, I still think that was justifiable. Um, but I think by about, I mean, I think by late March, it was clear that it wasn't growing um, exponentially. Which is it's, it's, it's a word exponential is now a word that it's like fingers going down a blackboard for me, uh, but it clearly wasn't growing exponentially by the end of March, and by eight, mid April, uh, by that mid April, I think it was it was it was very clear that you know, the health the health system wasn't going to be um, superseded, it wasn't going to be um, breached as it were, we weren't going to run out of capacity. You know, we didn't need 18,000 ventilators at all. I don't think we've ever used 1,000 ventilators. Um, and uh, it, it, it was clear enough in mid-April that social distancing should have been rowed back. But you know, I still think, I still think, I, mean, I still cut the government slack from for the mid-March original lockdown. Even if Sage weren't recommending, I can see why it would have been such a good call to make at the time, particularly with all of Europe doing something different. I can still see why they, why they came to that um, decision. But at, at, at what was every point since, it's been very clear that the correct approach was the Swedish approach. They just never had the ability to realize they made a bad trade and to get out of the trade um, with the minimum cost. They could have just put their hands up and say, hey, you know, we were overcautious. You know, isn't that the right thing to do with people's you know, health in our hands? But it turns out we did more than was necessary. So we're going to you know, now mimic a country that clearly has taken the right approach. So um, yeah, I, I give I give the I give the government good marks early on, and then progressively worse marks, uh, virtually every week since then. Yeah, I, I broadly feel the same way. I have very sort of lib libertarian instincts, but I think it's easy to to stand on the sidelines with those instincts. If you're in government and you know the fires are going off all around you, um, you're gonna you're going to inevitably reach for some kind of an extinguisher, aren't you? Yes, uh, yes. So it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, and that's that's fair enough. They did they did well at the beginning, but after it became clear that um, that it was nowhere near as serious as as first feared, um, they should have they should have um, took the foot off the pedal really. Yeah, um, yeah. And that didn't I think happen. Actually, in, I mean, to, give, to cut them a bit more slack, you know, the I think Rishi Sunak's scheme 
worked brilliantly to get people not only back into kind of supporting uh, restaurants and so forth, but just also just used to going out and getting used to the idea that you can go out and then you don't die. You know, just literally getting people out of their houses and moving again. And you can see that you can see this is why the virus has spread so much through the relatively young people is because Rishi's scheme was so successful. It's fantastic. The complete, you know, complete triumph. You know, I actually think the furlough scheme probably uh, is also going to have preserved an awful lot of jobs that otherwise wouldn't have been lost. So, all fantastic. And now all of a sudden, it just looks like we're going to make all the same mistakes again. You know, it looks like we're going to close down the parts of the economy that don't need to be closed down. We're going to protect the parts of the population that don't need protecting. And we are not going to you know, take the measures required to keep uh, the virus out of the exact places it needs to be kept out of. You know, obviously, basically the hospitals to stop uh, nosocomial infections and, and care homes. So, we, you know, I, I, I can't give them high marks for repeating all the same mistakes twice now that we know much more about the virus, the disease, uh, and more effective ways of you know, using the policy levers they've got. I'd like to um, have you talk a little bit about the furlough scheme because I'm I'm very critical of it. I think it has um, led to a situation where I can see my closest city, which is Manchester, um, looking like Detroit in a few years' time um, because of the furlough scheme. Not just because of the furlough scheme, but um, I think it's certainly um, playing a big a big role. Um, London too is um, is emptied out in the centre. Um, you're Bristol, aren't you? Um, yes, that's right, yeah. What's, what, what's it like there? Um, well, most offices are somewhere between you know, roughly a quarter and a half full, uh, which is partly because um, people have been allowed to carry on working from home you know, because of the, if they're worried about the virus, and partly because the, the social distancing measures you need to do in offices just mean you can't run them at capacity anymore. Um, yeah, I, I, I know where you're coming from, Ronan, and, and you know, the, you've, got the, you've, got the, you've got the kind of the twin moral hazards that, first of all, it makes people think they've got a job that they really haven't got, and they're kind of like, why are you coyote it? Run off the edge of the cliff, and legs are spinning, and they haven't realised they're about to hit the floor. So there, there's, there's that. There's also the problem that while people are furloughed, you know, they're perfectly happy to be locked down, and that actually if more of the public was just braying for normal life to resume, you know, that might help the government to um, change its policy. So I do get I do get the arguments against against furlough, but equally I just I do I do suspect in the round that it is easier for um, I think I think companies are probably more likely to retain someone with the help of the furlough system than to have decided hang on you know this is going on for so long I'm just going to reduce the workforce and I just I I, I would imagine that they wouldn't then have ended up rehiring as many people as the furlough scheme would retain if that makes sense i've got no proof for it at all but it's just a gut feeling i've just got a gut feeling that the um the scheme will have probably saved really quite a few jobs and again you know i mean soon actually probably worked out also that there's a lever you pull that's actually attached to two cogs you know so if you if you do let the furlough scheme lapse in its entirety you still end up paying those people it's just you're paying them universal credit rather than furlough so, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how much of a money saver it would be to turn the furlough scheme off anyway. I have about the same gut feeling in the short term. My concern is that in the long term, we will have taught a lot of companies that they can outsource to Bangladesh, India, um, and so on. Um, and that people people who are, who are working from home at the moment need to keep that in mind that, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, look at us having a conversation now over the internet, quite clear. Um, yes. Although our listeners don't realise we had 20 minutes of trying to get the audio working before this sure. starts. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I don't know. I, to be honest, Ronan, I, whenever I've been in a kind of a few ups and downs, uh, a few recessions and busts and things since I started work, and it always looks like the future is going to be much more different than it actually ends up being. You're trying to work out what the future looks like when you're in the middle of a big episode. Is really really difficult. I remember working in London just after the, uh, 9/11. There's police, abs- oh, police absolutely everywhere, and people were saying, "Well, you'll never get anyone to work in a skyscraper or live in a skyscraper again." And you know, this, people aren't going to be using planes regularly anymore. Six months later, that was all. Uh, same as after the 7/7, you know, attacks. You know, oh, you'll never get people to go on buses again. 
completely forgotten six months later. So when you're right in the middle of these things, it's really tricky to work out just how different the future will be. I'm sure it will be different because people have had a six month experiment of working from home, but they've had that experiment during the sunniest spring ever and you know a pretty decent summer as well. I wonder how much, particularly once sort of more than half their workforce are back, I wonder how much they wanna be the people who are still at home if it's a really miserable, freezing cold January day. You know, I suspect the future might be quite a bit more normal rather than rather than new normal. Well, I, I like your optimism. Um, and I, 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 and I, I'm the last I take optimist. Your point. I take your point, I do. Um, moving, moving slightly away from um, um, that section, civil liberties. This is something now which I'm also very worried about. Um, you know, the Mil- Milton... Milton Friedman line about nothing being so permanent as a temporary government program. Um, I'm, I'm worried that, that that's going to be the case with um, the the enormous reach into our personal lives that the government has uh, undertaken here. It's it's alarming. You know, £500 fine now for venues that don't take details down, as I said earlier. Um, and, you know, the rule of six and all this, um, you know, quite incoherent nonsense. But nevertheless we are giving giving massive powers to the police and of course they've also now started to employ so-called covid marshals which sounds to me like like the stasi or the checker um yeah well what's what, what's happening here well i think we need we need a root you know root and branch look again at how these statutory instruments are used you know we, we the, the, the covid act was passed in a real hurry back in March, when it was clear that Parliament was going to have to be suspended. Action was sort of needed now, because it looked like there was a train coming down the tunnel at us. Uh, it was a real hodgepodge, uh, a ragtag act. It, it kind of hangs off another act, the 1984 Health Act, which kind of was actually kind of well thought through. Um, but since then, uh, Matt Hancock has basically been able to pass the laws he wants. You know, you pass these statutory instruments um, at quarter to midnight, and they come into effect at one minute past midnight. They never actually pass through scrutiny. I mean, I, I, I don't know how kind of politically plugged in you are, but I had no idea of these made negative and made affirmative mm. ways that statutory instruments could be laid. You know, they might be subject to um, future s- scrutiny, but maybe not for a month afterwards. It's the whole the whole system. I mean, it really doesn't. I, I just very innocently assume that laws that are passed that would affect me, go through Parliament, um, go through some kind of process of scrutiny and challenge and debate. But it turns out that we can actually just sign our rights over and they can be passed by diktat and fiat. Now, you look at, the rule of six is actually a really good example. I mean, when was it announced to Parliament? It was announced to Parliament after it had already been announced as a, 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 at number 10. Yeah. Well, that isn't the order these things are meant to be in. It's meant to be passed in Parliament as a law and then the, you know, then the country's told about it. It's very far from clear it's required. Very, it's very far from clear it would make it through Parliament if it was debated. Um, but you know, I really hope there's some more scrutiny and challenge of this whole way of um, allowing statutory instruments to depend from um, acts that were passed, frankly, in a bit of a hurry. But, yeah, I know the Coronavirus Act is actually up for renewal at the end of September because, thank God, you know, someone managed to get a six-month review rather than it being staying in place for the full two years. I think there's no prospect of it being voted down. But if it was uh, either voted down or amended such that statutory instruments would be subject to some kind of parliamentary scrutiny and vote first, that would be, I think, a very good thing. I, I share all of your reservations, really. I'm absolutely alarmed. You know, I think, I think the COVID wombles is going to be an absolute farce. The idea of some sort of lollipop lady telling a group of beard up 20 somethings to disperse it's going to add in an absolute shambles and chaos so i don't know quite what they were thinking there um but yeah these these, these rules seem completely arbitrary I, I mean show me show me uh, the epidemiolo- epidemiological paper that says that you know six is the right limit for, you know to, to reduce the spread of the disease it's it, it, it just seems completely random it shows up this kind of a random policy generator that's spun and they sort of reach their hand in and pull out the kind of the fortune cookie uh, script of what the next policy should be. It's extremely unclear. If there is any evidence behind it, it's not explained. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, share, I 100% agree with you. And, you know, just 
just like you said, you know, it's once you've kind of let the genie out of the bottle um, of giving people this sort of taste of ultimate power. I just hope we can put, I just hope we can put the genie back in the bottle. And history isn't encouraging, but what is encouraging, I think, is there's a lot of voices from the back benches who are pretty outraged about this. And maybe it's topical also to say that those same voices who are outraged are also the same MPs that Boris really needs for the upcoming um, Brexit uh, shenanigans in the, in the Commons. So I'm hoping that he might give them, uh, he, he might listen to them more than he necessarily would normally need to. But yeah, I think this is something that when this, when these current clouds have cleared, you know, I, 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 I'm not hopeful, but I would be very pleased if there was a bit more um, challenge on whether this is the right way for us to pass laws or whether we need some kind of dead man's handle when they are passed. I mean, maybe when it was originally passed, if they said that this is the intervention that comes in when this metric, this bit of data goes through this particular threshold and it will be, be reversed when it goes through that threshold. And if we had, if we had some kind of visibility on, 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 what, on how they're making these decisions, I think people would actually kind of accept the interventions um, much more willingly. Um, but it seems to be kind of made up as it goes along. And I think, I, th I do think it all comes back to this idea that they think they've got much more agency over controlling the virus than we ever actually have. Yeah, um, I'm very, very good. They do, they do seem to believe that they can control things which seem wholly uncontrollable to me. Um, and that's, that's very worrying. Um, because again, it's, it's, it speaks to the idea that they, um, they believe in their, and their powers they think they have mm. magic powers perhaps yeah um, i think i think maybe they sort of false opposition up in their head i think maybe they think that if they couldn't control it the way they think they're controlling it the only alternative is to do nothing but actually it might be a really positive thing for them to accept that hang on we can't stop the spread because you know, this thing's had a, a billion years to evolve ways of you know evading cells that are trying to stop it getting in but what we have got is we've got tests and we've got interventions we can use intelligently so we can't you know we can't stop it uh, our interventions won't be 100 percent successful but given those limitations given the scarcity of our resources like what's the really intelligent way to kind of draw a perimeter around the vulnerable and sort of protect them what's a really intelligent way uh, to use all the tools we've got at our disposal uh, and it never, it just, it doesn't seem like they ever actually sat down with the people who could have helped them, like Professor Hennigan at um, Oxford University, who was speaking at the Science Committee uh, yesterday in the, in, in the Commons. You know, he, he seems to have very, very clear ideas on how you use the PCR tests, on which parts of the, of the population to protect and which not. And it just looks like they didn't sit down and try and write a plan, assuming that they didn't have complete control which means they didn't ask the people who could have helped them. So I wonder if that's part of the problem of why it's gone wrong is, you know, as ever, if you don't ask the right question, you won't get the right answer. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, do, you, do you think we're going to see any change in the, in the, in the coming weeks? Well, it's all, the, all, the, all, the, all the kind of the smoke signals are not encouraging at the moment. It seems to be second lockdowns curfews you know extra work from home order so the signs are not good and it's terrible news that it sounds like the outbreaks have got into um, care homes and then back and forth from the care homes to the hospitals uh, yeah. certainly that's happened in the tame side so that's not good i think i, I think what we need is um we, we basically need we just need to accept i think that the government has sort of got itself in so deep like kind of you know like Macbeth or like general Hague. They're so far in that realistically they are just wedded to this quasi zero COVID suppression strategy. And it looks like they've given up on the kind of the mitigation um, kind of flap and the curve strategy. So I think the only thing that will save us really is um, a combination of uh, taking the advice of people like Professor Hennigan and using the tests we've got more intelligently so that we're minimizing false negative, uh, false positives and weak positives so that we're minimizing the disruption to people that need to be disrupted, using the tests much more um, as, as a scarce resource. So really targeting them at the hospitals and care homes 
And I think they are starting to do that. So I'm hopeful there. But I think what we need basically is a few, a, 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 at least a few days of data where it's clear that this second wave of ours is not going to be like the first wave. Because if it does start taking off, going through the roof, then it doesn't matter what the rest of us say. The government has, you know, we know exactly what tracks it's going to be on. But if we see that it's actually growing slowly enough that the health service will definitely be able to cope, and I'm hoping there might be some way of kind of talking them down from the, down from the precipice. I mean, there's absolutely no prospect of us running out of ventilators. I think we know that for sure now. And that was, the, that was the number one thing I remember from the news, is we have to shut down because we're running out of ventilators by the second. Well, now we don't, ventilators are very rarely used for COVID now, so we're not going to run out of those. We've got the Nightingale hospitals under dust sheets, uh, and, you know, the hospitals have never been empty yet. So as long as it grows slowly, it will, it will grow because respiratory viral diseases grow in winter. I mean, that's, kind of, that's what they do. Um, but as long as we know for sure that the NHS will cope, and there might be a way to kind of um, have a, you know, another narrative. But if the, if, the, if the data takes off again, then you know, it's, all hope is lost, I'd say. I see we just need a few days where people say, oh, hang on, it's, it's not taking off exponentially, it's growing, but very, very slowly. Um, and preferably even, it'd be, it'd be fantastic to see it topping out and starting to decline. I think it was the first signs of that in Spain already for their second wave. You know, it's certainly the cases don't look as though it looks as though the cases are coming down rather than going up. Hospitalizations seem to have stabilized. Um, and the deaths are the deaths they, they, they have more deaths than they did in midsummer, but it's the deaths are stable and at a level which is not even a fraction of what they had in the spring. In Spain, about sort of 60 or 70 people a day are dying at the moment. But that's in a, you know, in a country of tens of millions. You know, you, we, we won't have it down to zero while this virus is becoming endemic. Um, so I think the main thing we need is for the numbers to move in the right direction consistently for at least a few days, just so that the ministers don't panic and they don't feel as though they're being kind of uh, bounced into a huge intervention, um, which would be avoidable. And if, if just a few days data gave them the escape space to you know, think a bit more rationally. But also, you know, we need to we need to pivot to um, to using our testing in a, in a much more sensible way. And I'm, I just I, I was really encouraged to watch uh, uh, Professor Hennigan at the Science Committee yesterday because he seems like he understands the tests, you know, from A to Z. Uh, he knows exactly the reasons they've been throwing up, you know, the wrong conclusions for policymakers, and he seems to have a plan to get us out of it. So I was I was heartened he was invited to speak, and I was you know pleased that they let him. You know, explain things fully. I just hope something comes of it. Me too. Um, there was a, a journalist, um, she called Eloise. Um, she's on the, on the ground there reporting from the Science Committee. Um, yes. She did a blow-by-blow blow of Professor Hennigan's, um findings and I highly recommend re reading them. I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the comments um, below this podcast when I post it. Yeah, Carl Hennigan has been fantastic, hasn't he? Oh, I mean, at, at every point, you know, at every point, he's, he's, he is a true national treasure. You know, he's just just in the last couple of weeks, he's worked out that you know, PHE was public health England was you know, massively overstating the death figures because if you get if you get knocked over by a bus having previously had a positive COVID test, you were COVID death. Well, I mean, give me a break. Uh, the Scottish hospitals, you know, he worked out that people are being they're in hospital for completely unrelated reasons. But if they previously had a COVID test, a positive COVID test, they showed up as a COVID case. You know, that reduced hospitalised COVID patients by about 80%. Um, he worked out that the, the Welsh were also hugely overstating their hospitalised figures. You know, everything he looks at, he seems to find calamitous misstatement. I don't, I don't say intentional, but cat-handed use of the data. Um, and also now on the, on the actual tests, which are kind of hanging like a sword of Damocles over you know, kids in the working age population. You know, he's, he's done several papers now pointing out that we're finding fragments of viruses that might have, might have been cleared two months ago. And people are you know, tens of thousands of times lower concentration than would be required for them to be infectious, but they're still being just triggered as a binary positive rather than negative. Uh, but thankfully having pointed it out, it does sound like public health England it's going to be changing its guidance. Well, it's changing its guidance on that. So, yeah, he's he has 
the fact that we're not currently in a much, much worse situation is largely thanks to him. So, uh, yeah, chapeau. Yeah, and just to say that uh, the journalist I was talking about before is called Jade Eloise Norris. I want to give a, give a shout, out, shout out to her because um, she's been, been fantastic. Yeah, um, the testing picking up dead viral fragments um, is is alarming. It really is. Um, it makes you ask, you know, just how many of these people, you know, are are sick. How many of these cases are truly representative of sick people? Of course, that's before exactly. you even um, um, cut down into how many of the people who truly tested positive are actually symptomatic. And well, it, 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 even more fundamentally, Ron, what is a case? Like the, the number one thing that's in the front of the papers every day is this many cases. Hmm. What, what, what is what is a case? I mean, this is a disease. You'd normally expect a disease as a kind of minimum to make you ill. Yeah, so we seem to have redefined, and in this case, you could verify which particular thing is making you ill by, once you've got the symptoms, giving you the test to see if you're carrying, you know, significant amounts of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's, that to me is a case. But what's being reported as cases in most, but not all countries, is anybody who will trigger a positive on a PCR test regardless of the amplification and, and, and the amplification levels on all these PCR tests seem to be turned up to the absolute max so it's like the you know it's like the um, fable of the guy who had a grain of rice on the chessboard and it was doubled each on each square you know we're, 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 we're running these PCR tests it sounds from Professor Hennigan's papers it sounds like we're we're running them about 10 cycles of doubling too high to test whether someone's infectious now, if that is, that's not 10 times too high, that's, that's 10 doublings too high, two to the power of 10. So, you know, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. So over a thousand times higher than they would potentially be infectious. And, you know, it's six months into the epidemic before someone's pointed this out. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not even sure that what we have been declaring as cases are cases. If someone's asymptomatic, but they trigger a test, should we be reporting that as a case? I don't think the Chinese do. Um, and I think a lot of, it sounds like a lot of countries in Europe are running their PCR tests about 10 cycles lower than us. So uh, this is one reason we can't really compare one country with another. You know, we're running the same tests but on different settings. And then we're declaring, some people are declaring cases if they're symptomatic and some people aren't. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite possible, for example, just to go back to my own children, it's quite possible the lad who was coughing in class, in my daughter's class, had a completely unrelated uh, virus and that the test was picking up it's tiny fragments of the virus he might have been infected with two months ago, but his system's still clearing them through, in which case he's isolating for a fortnight, as are 70 other kids from the school for absolutely no reason. And it's because no one's actually sat down and thought, hang on, we've got this test, but what are the right parameters to run it with? That is... is is truly crazy what why why have we um decided to turn the volume up on testing relative to other other countries and um i mean it kind of looks like they're they're, they're desperate to find as many cases as possible um I, I, again I, again i you know I'm, I'm a real believer in hanlon's razor you know the you know, unintentional cock up and things just going wrong rather than conspiracy i think what it is is early in the epidemic when all the parameters are really unclear you think, well, we don't know quite how um, dangerous it is. We don't know quite the level at which we have to set these tests to find the levels of virus that could be infectious. So we're going to turn everything up to 11, you know, like Spinal Tap. Just turn everything up to full, and we'll worry about refining the parameters later. But the problem is they never came back to refine the parameters. And it's left to other researchers, again, like the sainted Professor Hennigan, to work out, hang on, it looks like... I can set the thing 10, you know, 10 whole doublings lower than you've got it set, and I still can't find any, any um, samples that I can cultivate into infectious virus. So, you know, I cut an awful lot of slack to everyone on this for the first month or two when things were unclear. But after six months, I think patients should start to run thin. Yeah. Um, In other so words, you want maximum inclusivity at the beginning. So, again, on coming up to Public Health England, anyone who dies who has tested positive, let's just get them in the figures, just so we don't miss anyone out. Let's set all the tests to maximum. Let's just be maximally inclusive so we're not losing any data. I get that. 
but you know urgently as you pass through you need to work out what the right settings for all the data and all the reporting are and it just looks like they were never interrogated they were set on day one and they were, they were sort of set and forgotten um and i just i do think that it is a large part of the reason for the fix yeah i mean i i always say this and it's that it's that i'm i'm a rational explanations type of a guy i resist conspiracy theories um which is not to say that i don't believe that people conspire because of course they do um but conspiracy theories in terms of you know the the moon landing was faked and all this sort of stuff um i tend to push that away i have to say though with 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 covid recently um i found that that uh, put under quite a bit of pressure by just how crazy everything is mm. it makes me wonder to what extent not um was the pandemic planned it's like pandemic is the term isn't it um oh, yeah. i don't think that's the case um but i wonder just how how much of uh machiavelli's dictum about never letting a good crisis go to waste is in action here and you know you got for example um the green the green lobby um it's mm. very powerful and there's people who believe that that we should um, return to some kind of uh, agrarian-like society to protect the climate or something. Um, I wonder. I wonder um, if there are um, any of that's going on. You know, are they trying to change things and using this as an excuse to do it? The Great Reset. The Great Reset. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. The, one of the things. So, I mean, I'm 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 a, I'm a lot I'm a lockdown skeptic, if you like, uh, purely because having looked at the data, I just don't think it's worked. Well, I think it's actually been counterproductive. It's quite a broad spectrum, our, our side of the um, you know, believer or skeptic about lockdown. You know, there's there's you, you, there's the full kind of Bill you know Bill Gates wants to put microchips under our skin, uh, and it's you know it's it, it was you know, it was purposefully released by the Chinese and that. That's there is there is one end of the spectrum. I got to say I am I am pretty much completely over the opposite end of the spectrum. I always believe in cock up rather than conspiracy. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all, actually, and this is total speculation, but I wouldn't be surprised at all, actually, if it did um, originate in a lab uh, as an accident, sort of escaped by accident. I wouldn't, I, you know, rather, rather than an experiment looking into viruses that accidentally escaped, I could easily believe that, particularly given it happened to break out in, in Wuhan where the virology lab is. I wouldn't, that, that wouldn't surprise me. The idea of it being intentional um, or being used as a kind of a Trojan horse for the Greens to further their kind of great reset. That I find impossible to believe. But if, I mean, if, if you were to say, which I think you are saying, that they're sort of just taking advantage of the situation to further the kind of, you know, the BLM and the Green agenda, particularly in election year, then I think, yeah, I mean, absolutely, as you say, you, know, you, you make the most of the circumstances you've got. And here you've got a circumstance where you know, governments don't look capable and you do look as though you have the opportunity to have a new normal. So you want it to be your kind of new normal. Yeah, no, I, not that I'd agree, but I'm, I, I, none, of the, none of the conspiracy theories have to say, they, you know, I hate to be rude to this and I find them kind of amusing. I can't believe them. Yeah, but the, the, the Greens, I mean, the one thing is, funnily enough, if, if, if that's their intention, it doesn't seem to work very well. Looking at recent polling, it looks as though environmental concerns have really slipped down the agenda on, in terms of what people are worried about. People are much more worried about, you know, obviously their health, but also the economy, how they're going to get their jobs back. And it sounds like a lot of the um, fixation with um, the net zero idea, which I could talk about for about 10 hours, uh, a lot of the fixation with that idea turns out to be the, the luxury of good times. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I don't think that, that they're necessarily concerned with public opinion. I think that's um, that's why they're trying to shoehorn um, Soviets, or the, what they they call them citizens assemblies, don't they? But I call them Soviets because that's what they are um, into into play here. And I'm trying to have little um, little teams of, of people who are in support of their their agenda um, make all of the decisions and um, get a, get a hundred random people from around the country to to come and sit there and sign off on it. Um, oh God, yeah, yeah. This I mean, has been going on for years. I mean, this is not. This is. I don't, I'm not sure. I've seen much sign of it accelerating in in the last six months. Uh, it, you, know, it, the, you know, the left has done its best to take over, you know, academia and the media. 
and you know they're um you know they're like that fungus that takes over a carpenter ant you know <laughs> they take over the behavior so that they can sort of spread the spore as widely as possible you know it works absolutely brilliantly uh but i mean the last six months if i'm not sure i, I think a lot of the um a lot of what they, the left has really tried to do. I say the left. I mean, I don't think I'm particularly right. I think I'm fairly centrist. But just sort of watching, you know, the um, the uh, a lot, of, especially what's going on in the states. A lot of the riots over there, uh, and looking at you say how the extinction rebellion is trying you know, not to let a good crisis go to waste. I think they're I think they're overplaying their hands a lot. And I suspect public opinion might think this wasn't the time to do it. And um, we're sort of seeing them slightly for what they are. I wonder if they're sort of, they're so shrill about it, they're sort of scouring out their own support, um, you know, and they're sort, of, they're sort of giving up good footing for what they think is a killing blow. Uh, but actually, I think they might sort of lose their balance a bit. Um, we'll see. It, it, it does look as though, certainly in America, it certainly looks as though uh, they've overplayed their hand quite a bit in terms of the anti far rights. I think a lot of just, you know, middle America wants it all over now. I guess we'll find that soon enough. Absolutely. Um, Victor Davis Hansen um, at, at Stanford um, makes a, a good and perhaps worrying point about that. And it's, it's that um, middle America is, is so sick and tired of Antifa, BLM, the sort of Democrat sponsored mayhem um, that they may just vote for Biden or not vote at all. Um, because they're hoping that maybe if Trump, if Trump um, is removed, maybe it'll all go away. You know, I, I don't think, I don't think that it will. Um, but that, that's his theory, and, and you know, he's someone, he's someone who's worth worth listening to. Um, yeah. Well, this, this, I mean, when people aren't happy with their circumstance, and you give them a single button they can press that will make the world different, they will press the button, uh, and. I Without, without going into Brexit, I think yeah, there were some people, I didn't say all at all, uh, there were some people who, they weren't happy with the direction their life was taking and the way that, you know, the kind of world they were growing up in and so forth. And that was a button they could press and they pressed it. Uh, and maybe that will happen in the American elections as well. And that people aren't happy uh, and the one thing they can do is change the president. So maybe they'll vote to change the president. I mean, I think it'd be we could talk for hours about you know how, how good Trump is. I think it's very easy to make an argument that he's not a particularly nice man, but he's a, I think a very good president. Um, you know, the diametric opposite of his predecessor. But you know, it's, it's quite a subtle argument to make for people who think they're voting for the man, and who you know this is their once every four years you get a chance to either sort of carry on in the direction you were on or make a or change tracks, and they might just change you know, choose to change tracks. Um, unfortunately, I think they'll, they would be voting to change tracks to s somebody who would you know, make the things they're dissatisfied about worse. But you know, again, these are sort of subtle arguments that are diff difficult to get across in a, in a campaign. Absolutely. Um, I, think, I think Trump and, and Brexit were both um, reactions to a sense of um, lack of control. I know it's uh, um, easy to, to, to make mistakes when you're trying to compare such different places as the United States and and Britain, but mm. I do think there was uh, similar things going on there. And yeah, Trump take that was control. The... I mean, just just like we were talking about with COVID, you know, people people instinctively want to feel agency. You know, they want to feel they're not just being buffeted around on waves and wind. And um, you know, if you give them levers they can pull and buttons they can press, then they will tend to press and pull them. Uh, that's just human nature. Yeah, I, By the way, that's, that's leaving aside what I think about Brexit itself. But my, my point was not about Brexit specifically. My point was about, you know, if you give people every now and then the opportunity to, to change things, if they aren't happy, even if things aren't necessarily in their right, in, in, in their own interests, and I'm not saying Brexit isn't, but they will just, they will vote literally just for change. Yeah, that's the democratic uh, uh, safety valve, isn't it? Um, you, you, okay. vo you voted for Remain, didn't you? I did. I voted Remain. Uh, I thought about it long and hard, and I wasn't, you know, particularly convinced Remainer. And you know, the day after the poll results were announced, if they'd rerun it, I would have voted Leave because 
And if you have a referendum, then you have to enact it. I can't believe we're still talking about it four and a half years later. Uh, you know, this is, it's absolutely, absolutely shambolic. I mean, I, I voted for Remain, I've got to say, for very sort of non-philosophical, non-political reasons. I just, you know, the EU never got in my way. Things were very calm before 2016. Uh, and, you know, although I think it's got lots of flaws, uh, it just, you know, life seemed to function pretty well, basically. There's, there's, lots of, there's lots of things I wouldn't invent the way they are if I, if I was in control, you know. I don't think you'd sit down and plan, you know, the, the streetscape of London if you had a blank canvas, but these things just sort of grow up and end up the way they are and they seem to work pretty well. Yeah, and same until recently with the British political system. I don't think I would sit down and come up with the House of Lords and, you know, voting in corridors and, you know, select committees reporting in a fairly random way, but normally it actually works pretty well. Um, it's not something you design, but, you know, I, I like to, generally could I just leave good enough alone and and I was I was a bit fearful and people said it's maybe the easiest negotiation in history we we you know we hold all the cards that just made me instinctively nervous so you know I I, I wasn't I didn't particularly feel strongly either way and the moment we voted we just need to get on with it you know, I can't believe it's 2020 you know, more than a full Olympic cycle later uh, and we're, you know, we're still talking about it so I'm just I desperately, like COVID, I just want it to be over. I just, I just want to get back to, get back to normal, and um, talk about something different. Yeah, I think um, too few people on the Brexit side would recognise your position um, as as quite a, a Burkean anti-revolutionary um, conservative position, really, um, which is that you know things are working as they are, and revolutions seldom end well, and um, mm. No matter how you look at it, extracting Britain from the European Union was a revolution of sorts. Yeah, um, well, I think they're noble, actually. I mean, most of my friends voted leave. And, you know, it was on philosophical grounds of wanting to take back sovereignty. Uh, I personally am perfectly happy to give up a bit of sovereignty to have a bit more agency, you know, to have a seat at a bigger table. Uh, but I think it's noble. I mean, during my lifetime, you know, in... In wars, for example, whenever we try to change situations and take that control, we haven't always left things better. I'm thinking of Iraq, mm -hmm. Libya, uh, and so on. Um, sometimes a very imperfect, flawed system is better than the system you replace it with. So that's why I was just instinctively nervous about not leaving well enough alone. But yeah, we've made the decision, absolutely no sour grapes at all. And uh, like I said, I think the worst thing we could have possibly done was really run it. So I'm very glad that didn't happen. And now we just need to go through this sort of Goethe demo ring we're going through at the moment, even if it means a bit of a clash. And I hope everyone will see sense and we can sort of get on with life again and finally talk about something different. And I don't know what the newspapers are going to do next year. If Brexit's sorted out and there isn't a substantial second wave of COVID, the media's probably forgotten what else you write about. And it's probably back to Harry and Meghan and you know, miracle diet plans after that. Oh, I'll I'll take that. Uh, yeah, um, me too. You know, and then I can I can return to to you know re reading fiction and and um, <laughs> things things which I don't I don't really do anymore. Um, oh, God, so me too. I've got a pile of books by my bed by my bed. You know, my uh, the idea that I'm spending so many so many hours each week reading epidemiology papers is absolutely ridiculous. You know, I don't, never read any of that stuff before about April, Mar probably March actually. Um, and I'm looking forward to never reading another one again. Yeah, the idea that you, that, you know, we know things like, you know, everyone's very sniffy if charts don't have log Y axes. You know, all of us know about T cells and B cells and different types of antibody. And, you know, we've all got very, very, very strong opinions on things that we had absolutely no idea about six months ago. And we all have certainly forgotten in those times. Yeah, I just, I really want normal life back as quickly as possible. Yeah, all these mm -hmm. new terms like nosocomial and infectious dose oh. and all this sort of stuff, which... Um, yeah, exactly. You know. And also just, you know, it, I also want a little bit of dignity back for our, for, you know, for our, um, for our government. I mean, just watching the cock-up after cock-up, I mean, this is a national humiliation of like the track and trace system, the contact tracing system. I mean, it, it was obvious from day one that was going to be a total turkey. And it was just a slow motion car crash. Uh, you know, it just, it just, it, I just want it to be gone partly because there's, there's fewer things that the government will cock up then. 
Yeah, um, just to, to, to move on then to something which I hope they won't cock up and which I suspect will be discussed quite a lot in the next six months in the media. Um, the financial situation. Now, and it's, as um, everyone's aware who's listening, you, you um, work in finance, um, so it's, it's not something, something aliens, alien to you. Um, just before we pr- uh, pressed record, you were telling me that you feel quite optimistic about the financial situation, which perhaps makes you a bit of an outlier. That's to say the least. I think I'm the last optimist left, to be honest. I mean, so, so as it stands now, let's, let's, assume, let's, let's assume, touch wood, that there won't be a significant second wave and that actually the government can kind of stand down some of its interventions and we gradually do get back to normal life. You know, what, what we'll be left with, I think, is probably a deficit, something like 300, maybe slightly over 300 billion versus what we'd have hoped at the beginning of the year. So that's kind of a hole that you would think needs to be filled um, you know, we need to repair uh, consumer confidence and we need to repair employment. Uh, I, th- I was pointing out in May that th- these numbers are so difficult to get your head around. It's almost as difficult for the man on the street to get your head around 300 billion as it is to get your head around a virus that's one ten thousandth of a millimetre. So, I mean, in, 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 in kind of comparators that the man on the street might understand, you know, but this is about 10 Brexit bills. You know, that's, a, that's a number that, you know, was on the front pages for about four years. Well, the, lock, the, the lockdown intervention is going to cost us about 10 Brexit bills. But we are trying to finance that as a government at a time when interest rates have never been lower. So um, I think the government can probably finance that deficit at about a quarter of a percent uh, interest rate. So the interest costs on that extra deficit are only going to be about 750 million a year, which sounds a horrific amount of money, uh, but in a, in a, in a, in a, in a national in the context of national GDP, I don't say we lost in the noise, but it's, 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 it's better to just tolerate those extra interest costs and focus on productivity to kind of uh, er- erode it rather than looking at uh, raising taxes to choke off uh, the recovery. And I've got great, I, I think Rishi Sunak has been one of the, the discoveries of this year, and I suspect he'll come to just that conclusion. Um, and you know, you're just looking at the ONS figures this morning. It looks like consumer spending is bouncing back at a rate of knots. Uh, retail spending is 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 two percent higher than it was before the epidemic. Now, so it does look like there is scope to allow people's confidence to recover at the moment they think the coast is clear. Just just as in the summer, you know, the moment people thought it was safe to go back in restaurants, they came back to restaurants. You know, the restaurants were all full again, the bars were full again. You know, people have still got the will to get the economy back on its feet if, if they just think the coast is clear. Um, and on employment, like I say, I'm probably more of an optimist than you on the furloughing scheme, having retained uh, a lot of employment. You know, I think that if, if the rest of the economy looks like it's recovering, and in particular, if our, our kind of export partners are recovering as well, um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm much more of a kind of a V-shaped recovery than a kind of an L-shape or U-shape, all these other different shapes. You know, I can, I can, I can quite believe how, just like after um, you know, the Roaring Twenties, people think, my God, I survived First World War and Spanish flu. Let's have a bottle of champagne and celebrate. You know, confidence uh, can return very quickly once people think they're out of the woods. So I'm, I'm, I don't think it's worth the government overreacting to the extra deficit. It's a one-off structural increase that most of their peers have got as well. So it shouldn't even move the currency very much. Um, I think they should just put themselves up behind them, focus on productivity, focus on retaining employment. And I think, you know, within maybe a year, maybe 18 months, um, you know, the economy will be back to where it would have been if COVID had never happened. So I am definitely at the optimistic end of any opinion you'll hear from anyone who works in finance. Uh, but I can, I can see that as being a pretty reasonable narrative. Fantastic. Um, I, well, it, I wasn't... it hasn't happened yet. But... <laughs> Sure. I can I can see it making sense. Yeah, I mean, you you, you make you make a strong case. Um, I mean, it's a couple of things, I suppose. The 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 ten Brexit bills. Um, I would say it's ten Brexit bills plus losses. Um, and I wonder politically if Rishi will be able to do anything other than um, raise taxes, and that's raising taxes from the starting point of us having a fifty fifty year high. Um, Mm. Um, tax burden so that's and that's what 
what makes me a little, little cautious. Um, but, well, yeah, well, I, don't know. I think it would be a mistake. I think it would be a real mistake now, just when you want people to be investing as much as possible. You want as few kind of chocks under the wheels of recovery as possible. I think putting up taxes would be a horrendous mistake. You know, if, if you look at what Ireland did when they wanted to rebuild their economy, you know, low taxes is, mm. is what may, what, what's got the, what got the Irish economy moving in our lifetimes. Uh, and frankly, the lower the taxes are up to, down to a certain point, the better. I mean, I'm not sure we need to go that much lower, but I think increasing them would, it would send a really bad sign. And it would put, kind of, it would put sand in the engine um, of, a, of an engine that's going to be pretty, it would be difficult to start up anyway. The last thing it needs is more resistance. Uh, so I think that would be a really bad mistake. And, and also, I think, well, why pay it off? You've got this extra deficit. Fine, structurally, it's a little bit, we're running with higher deficits than we used to. So is everybody else. Um, and as long as we're not the only super indebted nation, I think we should just tolerate it and worry about it, you know, when the sky's blue and the sun's shining again. This definitely wouldn't be the time, I don't think, to, to immediately come out of the COVID crisis, probably the Brexit crisis, and then to worry about trying to pay debt down. I think that would be, and I'm a real kind of Keynesian, I think just open the taps, get people spending and confident, get the, get the economy moving, get, you have it running fairly hot, focus on productivity, uh, and maybe worry about maybe balancing the books um, a bit further down the line. I don't think it's a magic money tree, and this is a one-off you know, structural change that I think we're better to kind of tolerate for a while rather than worry about from day one. Well, I, I sincerely hope you're right. Um, I think I think I take a slightly different view. Um, she's like more kind of Austrian than than, than Keynesian, um, but I, I do I do think your example um, from Ireland is a very good one. I I was in Ireland during the Celtic Tiger, and um, it it worked. You know, I I still encounter people now who make comments about the corporation tax rate um, and how you know it's it should be raised. And I think, mm. no, no, <laughs> that's not the way to go. Definitely not the way to go. But that that's already been mooted in 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 the press here um, in in recent recent weeks, and that's quite worrying. I think it may even have been mooted in in government, but I, I don't I don't know that for sure. I can't remember. I don't know if you, if, mm. if you've heard anything. It just, it's one of those things that just sounds prudent, doesn't it? Because you know, we run our own households and our own budgets. You, you think well, the prudent thing to do is to live within your means, but you know every every pound that a government saves is not going into that economy. So, you know, the, the, the public pound is taken from the private purse, as it were. You know, so it's not, it's, it's not like running a household, uh, even though economics actually means, you know, rules of the house in Greek. It's not like running a household at all. Uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's you know, te technically they should just, I think, work out like, how do we let the economy run hot? I think Ireland, this is probably going down a bit of a rabbit hole we don't want to go down, but I think they probably let it run too hot and probably too much of their GDP is just nothing but royalties never actually properly passed through the economy. I don't think we need to go down the Irish route, but I think they do make the case that you know, if you send out a signal that you're open for business and the business comes. So, um, yeah, again, I, I'm just, I'm heartened that you seem to have someone, you know, in control of the public purse. He seems to have his head screwed on. Right? He seems a very capable guy, you know, which he's like. He's obviously very popular, and um, yeah, I think he's someone who have a lot of confidence. In. Do you think 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 that he is, um, he is perhaps the man to take over? Oh gosh, well, if it was, if for whatever reason Boris couldn't, he would be the front runner. I'm sure. And he hasn't put a foot wrong. He hasn't got any of the um, baggage from the Theresa May years or the David Cameron years. You know, he never stabbed anyone in the front or the back. You know, he's smart, presentable, you know, dishy rishy, uh, um, young, you know, he's, you know, first BAME Prime Minister, how fantastic would that be? Uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the Tories have, produ will have produced you know, two female Prime Ministers and, and a BAME Prime Minister. Not that that's the reason he should be selected, but it, it would be, I think it would be absolutely wonderful. Uh, and I think he's about the smartest cookie we've had for a long time in that job. Um, he's convincing, you know, he's He's, you know, he's cut his, he's cut his teeth um, outside government, and you know, having been parachuted in, what was it, a month before the COVID crisis? Hmm. You know, as soon as he had his hand on the tiller, he got the furlough scheme up and running quickly. You know, he had a suspension of business rates, 
and seem to get the universal credit scheme working with the Home Office. Yet everything is touched seems to have gone right. And then when Boris wants people back in the economy, he's, it, was, it was his scheme overwhelmingly that got people out of their houses. So, I mean, just purely on merit, you'd say that he'd be who your smart money's on. But, I mean, on, on Boris, you know, it's extraordinary that you know, less than a year after winning an 80 seat majority, we're even having this conversation, you know, talking as you know, what if Boris, as it were, doesn't last. Um, I hope I hope we do sort of see the old, I mean, I have very mixed feelings about, about Boris personally, but um, it's for all the promise that there was last December with such a strong majority and with someone who, for all of his faults, he is, you know, his bombast is a fantastic way of getting confidence back into the, um, back into the people and sort of lighting a fire under the country and probably under the economy as well. It's, it's, yeah, I, I, I hope his best days lie ahead of him. I, I, I'm a pessimist about that one too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think he's, I think he's, um, he's on, he's on the way out, out the door. Do you? Um, yeah. Do, do you I, subscribe I, to the idea that he's basically a campaigner, but not one who should be in charge of the actual kind of wheel of government? Um, yeah. He, he doesn't seem very good with engaging. I mean, one thing I will say, he doesn't seem to be very good at sort of tackling head on difficult decision making. I mean, he's, I think he's a fantastic campaigner, but the problem is that. If you're prime minister, by definition, all of the difficult decisions have been made before they get to you. So he's probably kind of learning on the job slightly. And it's maybe unfortunate. Normally, um, he would have a cabinet guiding him through this. He'd have you know, interaction with the back benches to guide them. And it's a nightmare, really, that the first really difficult thing he's had to tackle has coincided with parliament being suspended, trying to run cabinet on Zoom. Absolutely. It's, 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 it's almost like a tragedy, all these circumstances that have lined up to sort of expose some of um, Boris's weaker, weaker points. Uh, and it, but it might, it might be that, you know, if, if COVID's behind us soon, um, maybe his strengths will come to the fore in the final, the closing third on the Brexit negotiations. And if, if Brexit and COVID are behind us, I think Boris might be just what we need next year. So I think once those two are behind us, the fundamental thing, the the country will need is G, is geeing up, and he is, I think, just the, just the ticket for that. So I don't know. I I, um, I I kind of I kind of blow hot and cold on on Boris, but you know, there's no doubting his charisma, and that might that might you know, charisma actually can produce results that uncharismatic people can't produce, uh, and it might be that his skills are exactly what's needed in 2021, even though I think he probably hasn't had a great 2020. Yeah, um, I. I think, yes, we do need um, charis a charismatic, optimistic leader in some scenarios. But I think the problem with Boris is um, his his personality. Um, I think he's quite quite a vain um, man who wants to be liked, and that is a disastrous um, um, way to to approach negotiations. For example, I think he's mm. too likely to say to say yes where he should say no, um, and he seems to go missing quite a lot in action. So that's mm. another, another... It's funny because everyone originally was comparing him to Trump. You know, there's all the, there's all, there's all the graffiti of Trump and Boris kissing and, there was, you know, all the cartoonists stressed the fact that, you know, they're very similar, as it were, right-wing, libertarian, bombastic uh, characters. But actually they seem to have completely diverged uh, in 2020. And, uh, you know, in the closing furlongs of his first presidential term, it looks like Trump, like having resisted the siren call to create a war in the Middle East, it looks like he's actually maybe cracked the nut of Middle East peace. Absolutely mm -hmm. extraordinary. Uh, and like you say, Boris tends to go missing in action. I guess what we don't know from outside is how much COVID knocked him for six. He was in intensive care and there's speculation about how much he's got his health back. It's probably knocked his confidence. And I think he probably just probably thought he'd have a few months to find his feet before the first crisis and that just never happened so um yeah it's been it's been like a tragedy written to expose his weak points yeah it could be like Wood woodrow wilson um who who got the spanish flu and we only found out quite um, a long time after just how how badly it affected him um, yeah and his decision making in versailles for example um yeah, yeah but we'll, we'll we'll see i just i just hope that um 
that that Boris does recover. You know, I'm pissed off um, with with a lot of what's gone on, but obviously, I want the best for the country, and he is our leader. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I think health-wise, I think he's he looks like he's got his health back. I think the problem is he's had six months of people telling him he's doing a crap job in the press, and it's probably just it's it, it, he's probably a bit thin-skinned, and. Um, you know, he probably always thought he was doing the right thing, and um, he's probably just a bit alarmed that that view isn't necessarily shared. So, like I say, I think he might have a real off year, uh, but it might well be that his skills are exactly what's needed next year. So, it's very difficult. In, in the middle of a crisis, it's very difficult to work out the way history will judge both the episode itself, how different normality will be afterwards, and how well the protagonists have done. We need perspective for all three of those things. So, you know, I, although I personally wasn't a huge pro, pro Boris, I, I do recognize his skills. And, you know, I do recognize that well, they haven't been what we needed this year, to say the least. You know, um, they might be what we, what's needed next year. I mean, coming back to what we said about um, the kind of legislative dead man switch, you know, if only we'd done the Swedish route, which was when there's a public health crisis, the reins of government are handed to the heads of public health. You know, literally the reins of government in Sweden were handed to Giesecke and Tegman. Now, meanwhile, we have SAGE committees reporting to CMOs, reporting to CSOs, reporting to quads, none of whom have got any science qualifications, nor have the key spads reporting to a you know, historian and journalist, prime minister. And those are the people making the decisions. It's, it's set up to fail. Got a health minister who hasn't got any health qualifications. You know, in, 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 in Sweden, they had an epidemiologist running their response, guided by an epi another epidemiologist. So which of those systems is set up to succeed and which is set up to fail? Yeah, and that's, that's, that's very um, insightful. And I think it's very obvious what the answer is to that question. Um, I, would, I, would, I would add, just um, going back to the start of the conversation, that an economist should have been present and I would um, have hoped that was the case in, in Sweden too. Um, I don't like the idea of, of, you know, just epidemiologists telling us what's going on when they don't know anything about economics and they don't know anything about um, balancing policies in general. Yes, yep, no, sure. that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very fair point. Um, the, the board, the, it, I, 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 one thing I've never worked out is who actually appoints the people who sit on the SAGE committee. That is, I think, that, that is, well, it may be opaque, it may be that I haven't stumbled across how they're appointed, but you know, if, you were to, if you were to sit down and design one, you would want kind of, not competing teams of epidemiologists, but you'd want, you'd, you'd want people who are going to take not all the same view. Yeah, you'd want economists, you'd want, you'd, you know, you'd want cancer specialists who can say, listen, we can only miss, say, three to four weeks of cancer referrals before the cancer deaths start picking up, and this is the pace at which they'll pick up. You'd want, as I understand it, Sage never even had any immun immunologists on it. So the epidemiologists who track the outbreak of disease, they didn't necessarily even have the best information about what the nature of the virus was likely to be. Um, I mean, again, maybe this will be something for the uh, Royal Commission to look at when it's um, when it's when the inquiry starts. But you know, if we spend if we spend a, a bit more time thinking about the right constitution, I mean, you know, it was the right makeup of this age committee that might have actually solved a lot of our problems and you know, an, an econo economist certainly uh, not necessarily to look at the money side but to look at I mean, the science of trade-offs economics and my, you know, my god are we going to have some trade-offs once all the um yeah the the, the, the lockdown death toll becomes clearer I mean, it will rue the day that we never had uh, we, never, we never did the cost benefit analysis um i also just really I think relatively basic levels of statistics on things like the contact tracing um, uh, tactics and strategy, because it looked to me from day one like this had absolutely no chance of working. Uh, but it sounds like we were kind of bounced into it with the assumption it would work. And I just, I've never been able to work out how they thought contact tracing would make the virus, well, any, any useful amount of difference. But it's even yesterday, you know, there's, in this select committee, you know, um, is it Baroness Harding, Dida Harding? Yeah. You know, it's still, it's all on the premise that contact tracing is the way to beat this disease, beat this virus, whatever they say. 
you were talking about you know, tens of millions of tests, whatever it is, focused on contact tracing. It's still not clear to me mathematically that that is any useful way of controlling the spread of it. So again, you know, maybe there should have been more people whose only task was to say, hey, listen, the recommendation is to go down this route. Is it likely to work? And if it doesn't work, what are the, what are the hurdles that it's likely to knock over? Uh, so yeah, there's, there's all kinds of ways that hopefully next time we have a situation like this, we'll, we'll do things better. Um, it's, it's, it's set up for expert failure the way it's been done. Well, I think um, that is, is more, more excellent analysis there, Alistair. Thank you. And I think maybe we will, we will call it a day there and perhaps have, sure. another, have another conversation another time. Love to, absolutely. Well, you know, I've done a, I've done a few of these podcasts over the, over the last few months. And I always say, well, you know, I'm sure it'll be over in two or three weeks or three or four weeks. And six months later, here we are still. So, you know, in the nicest possible way, I'd love to talk to you again uh, publicly. And then I hope that when we do, it's not to discuss COVID because I hope it's all in the rear view mirror by then. But thank you for having me on. Amen to that. Thank you very much, Alistair. All the best. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers, Renner.